Welcome to Good Game. I'm Hex. And I'm Bajo. Welcome back, Bajo. Good to see you survive D3 and Los Angeles. Yes, well, I'm still coughing up smog and scraping the taste of the coffee off my tongue, but otherwise, a successful trip. Yes, well, how does a crawl em up sound to you? Because we have one of those later on in the show with Among the Sleep. I think something's coming. <laughs> there you are. Also this week, we spent a bit of time in the alpha of Destiny. Well, they sent the right team to handle this one. Plus, the Grid series takes a left turn with a more serious focus in Autosport. <laughs> oh, that's not cool. Oh, and Dave Callan blows the dust off another law. But before all that, can you name the game? Autosport is about mastering corners, seeking opportunity, and pushing the line. Masters know how to make solid racing games. From the grid to the dirt series, I've always found them to be enjoyable. Yeah, me too. There's just something about the way they balance their difficulty system and also the physics. It all just feels like it hits that sweet spot between simulation and arcade. Yeah, you can really feel the weight of the cars through the controller, which is a tricky thing to achieve. Hmm. Autosport isn't grid three. It's a sidestep to focus on pure closed circuit racing. From the hilly street tracks of San Francisco, the familiar torment of Australia's own Bathurst. Your goal in this game is to learn corners like the back of your hand and slowly creep up the positions until you're at the top. I'm no expert on famous racetracks around the world, but this game has finally taught me how scary Bathurst can really be. Oh, shit. <laughs> Those steep high corners and that long straight hex. Oh. Yeah, it's an incredible track. I've had nightmares about that straight, not coming out in time and crashing. Never really appreciated it until now. It's like going down a funnel. Yeah, and then there's this, like, all this dirt everywhere. Events are broken up into five main categories. You can approach them in a non-linear way, which is good, but you do need to play them all to unlock all the events. Bajo, my favourite discipline unexpectedly was open wheel. <laughs> Normally this kind of racing for me can get a bit tedious and repetitive, but just something about it this time was so thrilling. Yeah, I enjoyed it too. Normally I just spin out and crash a lot, but I did okay with this, mostly. I think they've just finessed the handling enough so that these high performance vehicles don't just feel like rockets on a shopping cart. I mean, they really hug the road. I also really enjoyed the endurance races. This mode brings Grid closer to the more serious racing sims by introducing real-time tyre wear. There's actually quite a lot of strategy to it, because if you push too hard early on, then your tyres will wear out, and by the end of the race, you really struggle to hold those corners. Yeah, it's just nice to have something else to think about, isn't it? Mm. There's a good sense of speed and control with Grid Autosport. I really felt like I was in the car as opposed to controlling it. Part of this is because there's a solid history of good physics under the hood with this series, but also there's plenty of those assist options that are balanced out with XP bonuses. It is quite challenging, but after a while, I just took so much satisfaction in even overtaking one car throughout a race. And there is a kind of twisted joy in that living in fear of damaging your car. The damage system returns along with the rewind feature. But even with a few rewinds in the bank, full damage makes you a very cautious driver. But once again, it's a balanced and well-designed system to punish you just the right amount, but not make you feel like it's unfair. And on top of that, the AI feels really reactive. Yeah, doesn't it? I felt like each car had its own personality and was just doing its own thing. Long gone are the days of those straight parade lines of vehicles, I think, Hex. I especially liked the races where the AI was really aggressive when they needed to be. We could only have a few hours with this online, so we weren't able to test out some of the community features. But with other players on the track, it makes for some very tense races. <laughs> oh, 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 oh
And I think it's really the main reason you'd play this game. Yeah, and of course, having no rewinds in online really raises the stakes in those high-speed races. Eyes on first. Oh, I've lost the tire. Oh dear. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm just going to try and hit you guys now. <laughs> It's almost more scary being at the back of the pack than at the front. I mean, I kind of want a collision to happen in front of me, Bajo, but it's also super scary. Oh, no! <laughs> oh. It's tough at the top, too, Hex, because if you break too suddenly, it can get messy very quickly. Oh. <laughs> for a second, for a split second. There's also derbies if you'd like to blow off some steam. One of the biggest new features are the in-car views, specifically the cockpit view, which some players missed from Grid 2. I'm glad that we have these views, but they're a bit simple, aren't they? Yeah, they're a little ugly too. It's kind of this weird depth of field silhouette. Yeah, in the end, I didn't mind not having that detail, though, because I kind of felt like a fighter pilot seeking out and destroying my enemies. I was disqualified a lot. Strangely, Autosport isn't coming out for PS4 or Xbone, it's just for last gen and PC. The developers have said that this is based on community feedback and that they had unfinished business with Grid 2. That all sounds a bit weird to me, but I'm glad that there is split screen in each version and the PC version looks great, which is what we reviewed it on. Yeah, although I will say that personally I'm not a huge fan of these straightforward circuit races and I don't feel like this one really rewarded me enough to push me through the campaign. Yeah, it is a bit of a no-frills campaign and it is slow going as well. We've barely scratched the surface. Yeah, I think that's what they aimed for though. Motorsport races really are for those who want to be better drivers and take satisfaction in a clean race and obeying the rules. I'm not usually a big fan of these circuit races either, Hex, but I enjoyed this much more than I thought I would. What are you giving it overall, Hex? Well, I think you have to go into this wanting a game of circuits and discipline, but if you're the kind of gamer that does, then you're going to have a good time, so I'm giving it seven. Yeah, I think this is a science step for the series rather than a step four, but I had a great time with this, so I'm giving it eight. And now here is Goose with the news. Thanks, guys. Oculus VR has announced its upcoming acquisition of the product engineering company Carbon Design Group. The company's previous work includes designing the Xbox 360's controller and Kinect unit. It's understood that Oculus has been working on multiple unannounced projects with Carbon over the last 12 months. A recent survey by the International Game Developers Association has shown a significant increase in female representation in the games industry. <laughs> I love you too. In 2009, only 11.5% of developers identified as female. This figure has nearly doubled over the last five years and is currently sitting at 22%. Cryotech, the developer of Crisis and Rise Son of Rome, has denied recent reports of financial instability. The reports claim that the company is on the brink of bankruptcy and has not been paying its staff on time. In addition to this, reports also suggest that the upcoming sequel to Rise has been cancelled. Many good officers and men were lost today. Cryotech has so far dismissed these accusations as rumours. Rome will not fall. Not today. And that's all the news for this week. Thanks, Goose. Developer Bungie's ambitious new shooter Destiny was recently in Alpha and we checked it out. This is developer Bungie's first game since Halo Reach back in 2010 when they broke away from Microsoft to become independent. So it's kind of a big deal. Yes, it's apparently got the biggest budget of any game ever. Half a billion is what's being reported and Activision have signed them on for a whopping decade-long publishing deal for the series. Not to mention those hefty Halo-sized shoes to fill. Yeah, so no pressure. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> For anyone who hasn't heard about it, Destiny is basically an online, not quite massively multiplayer online game, mostly cooperative, but also single player, first person shooter role playing game. But I think a quicker way to describe it would be a love child between Halo and Borderlands. Yeah, it's got that beautiful sci fi art, the swelling choral music, and the way the combat moves and feels, it's unmistakably Halo esque. Add in loads of guns, unlocks, leveling, different classes, and numbers flying off guys' heads. 
And you've got yourself Halo Lands through and through. To start off with, you get to pick between three classes with Titan, Hunter and Warlock. Each has a special grenade type and melee attack, as well as a powerful supercharge move and upgrade trees to work through. There are a few cosmetic options too, letting you choose between being a male or female human, awoken or exo, along with a bunch of other options to tinker with. There aren't the endless customization sliders you get in a lot of RPGs, but I think there's enough there to make your character stand out a bit. I was disappointed that I couldn't make him creepy and ugly like I usually do though. Yes, well thank goodness for that. The way the game tends to work is that most things can be played solo, but it does matchmaking in the background so that you can occasionally find other players running around with you. Yeah, I think that background matchmaking is what they're hoping will set Destiny apart from the pack. It's kind of a worry-free, passive take on co-op. And I like that you don't have to go and find your friends and actively create a match. It just does it all for you. Yeah, and that is cool, but it's hardly mind-blowing. I think what it does well is almost give the impression of being an MMO without actually ever having a massive amount of players in any one world. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's still just online co-op with an extra layer of pizzazz over the top. Mm. The campaign mission we got to play sees you heading off into an old radar station. It can't be. On the way, you take on groups of enemies and a scary room full of space zombies before finally facing a boss, Wizard. All the while, Peter Dinklage, a.k.a. Tyrion from Game of Thrones, chats away to you. I thought we had them contained there. The darkness could be a lot closer than we think. I didn't think it was particularly inspired mission design, personally. It was very standard shoot affair. Yeah, it's certainly not reinventing anything, but it was fun. And I did like that you can pull out little Star Wars speeder bikes whenever you want. But you can't ram enemies with them. Where's the fun in that? Well, maybe it's an upgrade. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> anyway, the offer didn't give much away about the plot. But from what we've gathered, a long time ago, humanity spread throughout the solar system and prospered thanks to the arrival of this giant mysterious ball known as the Traveller. But the Traveller apparently has a few enemies since a whole bunch of not-so-friendly aliens followed in its wake, promptly smacking our blossoming civilization down and leaving just one last bastion of humanity on Earth where the Traveller now sits, closely guarding us. I love the whole setup and the universe they've built with this, and I instantly wanted to go out and explore it. Yeah, it's an intriguing premise, but some of the writing we've seen so far hasn't been great. And to be honest, I've felt the same way about Halo games in the past. I think Bungie are really great at coming up with awesome concepts and story arcs, but just some of their dialogue can be a bit painful. The wounded. Code Alpha We're getting all of them out. Ma'am, squad leaders are requesting a rally point. Where should they go? To war. Yes, and some of the performances in Destiny are so bad, they've already inspired memes. <laughs> that wizard came from the moon. Still, it's all out of context at the moment, so we'll just have to wait and see if that story comes together in the final product. Yes, it's quite possible. There's a whole plot thread about a faction of moon wizards. Well, we can only hope. Mm. Lots of motion ahead. I admit, I was a little sceptical going into this hex. From what little I played at E3 and everything I'd seen, I just didn't get what all the fuss was about. But after spending some time with it, the hook started to get in, and I'm officially excited now. Yeah, it really has that mix of instantly satisfying combat and that ever-tempting carrot of better gear and loot. Mm. Add in breathtaking scenery waiting around every corner, and it's hard to put down. I was impressed with how polished and final this felt for a game that's in alpha. Yes, you can certainly feel all those hundreds of millions of dollars at work. And outside of the campaign mission, there's also a three-person strike mission, where you team up and deal with loads of guys and a few very tough bosses. I thought it felt a bit like an old-school WoW raid. Those bosses took some serious punishment and teamwork to go down. If you're even a little bit under-leveled for the job, prepare for a long grind. You know, an enjoyable, rewarding kind of grind that you want to see through. Well, they sent the right team to handle this one. There's also a free roam mode where you wander around the fairly large environment looking for mission beacons. Most missions are along the lines of killing a certain number of enemies or going to a specific location. It's general busy work, but useful for killing time and grinding some XP. I liked when you stumbled across other players and those big events kick off. I mean, they're pretty exciting. Yeah, I loved it when those big ships warped in. You might want to check this out. Between missions, you go to the tower, which is the game's main hub. It's loaded with vendors offering new gear and missions. You look like someone who's got something worth cracking. 
It's a nice looking place, but it felt a little sterile. No NPCs are really moving around, and it's crying out for some kind of mini games. Nothing will come of nothing. It is the perfect place to bust some moves, though. Bust a move. All right, get down. She'll be out there myself. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I liked and was a little offended by how the NPCs just looked at us. They clearly weren't impressed with our moves. <laughs> OK, let's talk. <laughs> there was one competitive multiplayer mode that we could test out. It's a standard capture and hold the point mode, but I had a lot of fun with it. Kills come a fair bit quicker than in Halo, but not as quick as COD. Zone C, neutralized. Yeah, it's good fun, and mixing in things like double jumps and supercharged moves gives it a unique flavour, and it keeps it feeling lively and unpredictable. All in all, I was impressed. They're not really doing anything that new or out there, but I think they're combining a lot of familiar ideas to make something that could be quite compelling. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the final game comes together in September, but it's got a lot going for it already. It is also worth noting that the alpha is now closed, but the beta begins in a few weeks. Hmm. An alpha and a beta. They really want to have a smooth launch, don't they? Yes, they do. Hello, I'm Dave. Have you been keeping up with your ancient Greek? Arati. That was ancient Greek for excellent. Did you know this? Kratos from God of War isn't just a juggalo rageaholic. He is actually a real character in Greek mythology. The son of the Titan Palace and the goddess Styx, who was the goddess of 80s experimental hair metal. Kratos was a walking, talking symbol of strength and might. In fact, Kratos is the ancient Greek word for power. You could mistake his grandiose personality for only child syndrome, but he actually had three siblings, Zelus, Baia, and Nike. Yes, Nike, the goddess of victory and sweatshops. These kids were Zeus's winged enforcers, essentially anti-gravity bouncers. In Prometheus Bound, an ancient Greek tragedy, Kratos helps his sister Baia, the goddess of force, chain the titan Prometheus to a mountain in an effort to prevent him from ever becoming a prequel to Alien. Greek tragedies, just so you know, often end with incredibly miserable people gouging out their own eyes again in an effort to prevent them from ever seeing a prequel to Alien. In the video games, however, Kratos is a crazy, crazy mixed up Spartan, tormented by the memory of killing his own family. For how could he forget his skin white with the ash of his dead family? The ghost of Sparta had been born. He's subsequently revealed to be a demigod. That's half god, half ex-wife of Bruce Willis and or Ashton Kutcher and the son of Zeus. But after being toyed with by Zeus one too many times, he faces off with the big king god and kills him. So not only does Kratos kill his human family, he kills a supernatural one too, which would make an incredible reunion episode of Jerry Springer. You cannot do this, Kratos! Stand against me, Athena! Come to think of it, he pretty much kills everyone he meets. Now, I'm not into victim blaming, but they do turn into power orbs, which pretty much encourages the killing. Uh. Thanks, Dave. Bajo, I was certainly intrigued when I heard about a game that offered a twist on the survival horror genre by having you play as a toddler. Yeah, I was a little curious as well, and also a bit concerned. In Among the Sleep, you take the first-person perspective of a little toddler who has just barely begun to walk. So don't expect to be able to run away when things get scary. <sighs> Whenever you're ready.
Happy birthday, sweetie. It's your birthday. You've just turned two years old and mommy has some birthday cake for you. A oh, boo 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 boo. Stop that. Sorry. Chugga 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 choo choo. <laughs> yes, but after a mysterious guest arrives, you're left alone in your room. And then things get dark, very dark. Well, you're not completely alone. <laughs> Thank you. You have this birthday bear to keep you company in the darkness. Something's not right. Which is supposed to be some sort of consolation, but if that's the case, maybe try making the bear a little less creepy. My name is Teddy. Nice to meet you. Let's play a game. Uh, get that thing away from me. Yeah, that thing is creepy. I want to show you something. We need some place very dark. After you start to explore the house, the reality of your baby movements start to sink in. You can walk, but it's more of a slow, ungainly waddle, and you can only do it for a short period of time. Crawling is much faster than walking, but you will need to stand again any time you need to use your hands. This is a really interesting device in terms of placing limitations on the player and creating a suspenseful environment. You don't know what might be listening. And being in the body of a helpless toddler in a game with sinister themes is already pretty scary. Large, looming, shadowy shapes seem to create terrifying monsters all around you before you even encounter any. When things get too dark, you can hug your teddy closer to create some light around you. And just getting from one room to the next is a challenge, as you need to clamber up onto chairs just to reach door handles. And at this point, you don't even know what the threat is. Yeah, and there's suspense just in the not knowing, isn't there? The only thing you do know, your mother is nowhere to be found. She's not here. So you'll have to find her. And this is where things start to get quite strange. Whoa. What is this place? Yes, you enter surreal fairy tale realms as part of your quest to find your mother, which are an odd mix of fantasy peppered with objects and symbols of the baby's home life. By locating memories and using them as keys into the next world, you start to try and collect pieces of a larger story and meaning. Yes, at times it's very Alice in Wonderland with the dreamlike oddity of it all, isn't it? Mm. And also being so small, you feel like you're in a land of giants as pieces of furniture and towering trees twist together to create a bizarre and frightening world. And of course, there is the monster. Yes, I like that no matter where you go in this world, the threat of the monster is always there. You can hide from it by crawling under furniture or into a cubby hole. But your best bet is just to be as quiet as possible and try not to draw attention to yourself. It's not always easy to be quiet, though. I mean, the level design will challenge your baby stealth with obstacles designed to make life difficult for you. Also, the fact that your toddler waddle isn't exactly the most agile of movements. It was an interesting mechanic, I thought, though not used nearly often enough. In fact, my encounters with the monster were pretty few and far between, so I was rarely hiding or worried for my safety, really. Yeah, there just wasn't enough threat, was there? No, the focus is really on solving basic puzzles to unlock the next area. Yeah, but even those were far too simple. I wanted the game to use more of the child's mobility limitations in the puzzle elements. Maybe the bear, as creepy as it was, could have played a larger role. I just think there were too many wasted opportunities. Yeah, I mean, just because we're playing a child doesn't mean we don't want to be challenged as an adult. And maybe that's where they ran into conflict. Yeah, I mean, I think this game rests heavily on creating these unique environments and then having the player try to piece together a story based on what they see. But sadly, the gameplay is just too simplistic, so you'll burn through it all quite quickly. And even though you are able to start to get a clear idea of the underlying message of this game, the ending is actually quite abrupt and maybe didn't have enough thought or care to it. Yeah, and you know, there are actually other games we've reviewed. Like, do you remember Papo and Yo? That dealt with similar themes of a child trapped in a frightening situation. But I remember that game really caused us to develop a strong connection. The mechanics weren't great, but it allowed that harsh reality to filter through in a way that really built up to an emotional conclusion. Whereas in Among the Sleep, you're right, it really feels abrupt and almost incomplete in a way. It's a shame because there are so many great ideas with this. And I really enjoy delving into each layer of this strange world from the perspective of a two-year-old. I think it's incredibly inventive in that respect. Yeah, just the imaginativeness of it all is just wonderful, isn't it? Finding all those links between the child's bedroom and this surrealist landscape was really great. And I love games that are daring enough to deal with themes like this, but for me it just needed a little bit more complexity and ultimately I was disappointed by the ending. What are you going to give it overall, Hex? I'm going to give it six and a half. I think it's worth a playthrough because it's short and unique, but a little bit more thought needed to be put into the progression of both challenge and story. Yeah, I agree. I'm giving it six and a half as well. And let's hope we never ever have to see that scary bear ever again. I think we'll have to bid each other fare thee well. So, did you name the game for this week? 
It was My Little Baby from 2011. Released first on the Wii, it was your mission to raise, what else, your little baby. Feeding, bathing, changing and playtime were all key to your little bundle of joy's happiness. And somehow it was way more creepy than anything in Among the Sleep. You didn't find the game inspired some sort of maternal instincts in yourself? Uh, no, all of that is spent on my cat's barjo, as yours are, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, speaking of cute furry animals, next week in our full review of Wildstar, I play a murderous rabbit. Look forward to that. Back already? And you made friends. Yeah, shut up and kill something. Plus we get on the ground and cuddle in EA's take on the UFC franchise. And over on Spawn Point, our show for younger gamers on ABC3 this weekend, we have a look at an RPG on mobiles called Battle Heart Legacy. Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Bajo, also out. Oh, you just missed me. <laughs> oh, I just got past that. That was my fault. <laughs>